we continue book three purgatorio from the diary of a drug fiend by aliester crowley with chapter six the true will lou and i were both utterly exhausted by the climb and king lamis reminded us that this was the formula of the Abbey of Thelema at Telepilus, that everyone had to reach the top, step by step, through his own exertions. There was no question of soaring into the air by alien aid, and in all probability coming to Earth with a bump. We had found ourselves repeatedly out of breath during the ascent, though it had only occupied three quarters of an hour, and we should certainly never have reached the top without recourse to heroin. But all the time we were lost in amazement at the behavior of the boys, their independence, their fearlessness, and their instinctive economy of force, we had no idea that it was possible for children of that age to achieve even physically what they had done apparently without effort. And, as for their moral attitude, it was entirely outside our experience. I said something of the sort, and King Lamis retorted at once that it was the moral attitude which made possible the physical attainment. You will find that out for yourselves in the case of your own experiment. It will do you very little good to break off your present practice. When you begin to tackle a subject, you must endure to the end, and the end never comes until you can say either yes or no, indifferently, to physical considerations. But for all that, both Lou and I were exalted by our physical triumph over the rock trifling as it was, and our situation on the summit reminded us of some of the sensations of flying. There was the same detachment from the affairs of the world, the same visions of normal life in perspective, the ruddy brown roofs of the houses, the patches of tilled land, the distant hillsides with their fairy-like remoteness, the level plain of the sea, the receding coastline. All these things were so many witnesses of one great truth, that only by climbing painfully to a spot beyond human intervention could one obtain a stable point of view from which to regard the universe in due proportion. At once we drew the moral analogy to our physical situation, and applied it to our immediate problem. Yet, in spite of what Lemus had said, we were both obsessed by the idea that we must stop taking heroin. The next few days passed in strenuous efforts to reduce the number of the doses, and it was then that we began to discover the animal cunning of our bodies. Do what we might, there was always a reason and an an imperative reason for taking a dose at any given moment. Our minds, too, began to play us false. We found ourselves arguing as to what a dose was. As the doses became fewer, they became larger. Presently, we arrived at the stage where what we considered a fair dose could not be conveniently taken at a single sniff. And then, worst of all, it broke on me one day, when I was struggling hard against the temptation to indulge, that the period between doses, however prolonged it might be, were being regularly uh, were being regarded merely in that light. In other words, it, it was a negative thing. Life consisted in taking heroin. 
Life consisted in taking heroin. The intervals between the doses did not count. It was like the attitude of the normal man with regard to sleep. It suddenly dawned upon me that this painful process of gradually learning to abstain was not a cure at all in any right sense of the word. Basil was perfectly right. I must reverse the entire process and reckon my life in positive terms. That's what he means by do what thou wilt. I wonder what my true will is. Is there really such a thing at all? My mathematics tells me that there must be however many forces there may be at work. One can always find the resultant. But this was all terribly vague. The desire to take heroin was clear-cut. It no longer produced any particular effect to take it. Now that I was getting down to three or two doses a day at the most, it seemed as though two or three doses a day yes. It seemed now that I was getting down to two or three doses a day at the most, it seemed as though there were no particular object in taking it, even as dulling the craving for it. I found it increasingly difficult to fill column two. King Lamis descended on me one morning, just after I had taken a dose, and was breaking my brain for a reason for my action. I was, I was, alternate, I was alternately chewing the end of my pencil and making meaningless marks on the paper. I told him my difficulty. Always glad to help, he said airily. He went to a filing cabinet and produced a docket of typed manuscripts. He put it in my hand. It was headed, Reasons for Taking It. One, my cough is very bad this morning. Note A, is the cough really bad? B, if so, is the body coughing because it is sick or because it wants to persuade you to give it some heroin? Two, to buck me up. Three, I can't sleep without it. Four, I can't keep awake without it. Five, I must be at my best to do what I have to do. If I can only bring that off, I need never take it again. Six, I must show I am master of it, free to say either yes or no, and I must be perfectly sure by saying yes at the moment. My refusal to take it at the moment shows weakness. Therefore, I take it. Seven, in spite of the knowledge of the disadvantages of the heroin life, I am really not sure whether it isn't better than the other life. After all, I get extraordinarily... extraordinary things out of heroin, which I should never have got otherwise. Eight. It is dangerous to stop too suddenly. Nine. I'd better take a small dose now rather than put it off to later. Because if I do so, it will disturb my sleep. Ten. It is really very bad for the mind to be constantly preoccupied with the question of the drug. It is better to take a small dose to rid myself of the obsession. 11. I am worried about the drug because of my not having any. If I were to take some, my mind would clear up immediately, and I should be able to think out good plans for stopping it. 12. The gods may be leading me to some new experience through taking it. 13. It is quite certainly a mistake putting down all little discomforts as results of taking it. Very likely, nearly all of them are illusions. The rest, due to the unwise use of it, I am simply scaring myself into saying no.
It is bad for me morally to say no. I must not be a coward about it. 15. There is no evidence at all that the reasonable use of heroin does not lengthen life. Chinese claim and English physicians agree that opium smoking within limits is attractive, conducive to longevity. Why should it not be the same with heroin? Well, smoking would actually limit lifespan, but um, it has been observed, actually, that addicts seem to be immune to most diseases which afflict ordinary people. 16. I take it because of its being prohibited. I decline being treated like a silly schoolboy when I'm a responsible adult. Note, then don't behave like a silly schoolboy. Why let the stupidity of governments drive you into taking the drug against your will? K.L. 17. My friend likes me to take it with her. 18. My ability to take it shows my superiority over other people. 19. Most of us dig our graves with our teeth. Heroin has destroyed my appetite, therefore it is good for me. 20. I have got into all sorts of messes with women in the past. Heroin has destroyed my interest in them. 21. Heroin has removed my desire for liquor. If I must choose, I really think heroin is the better. 22. Man has a right to spiritual ambition. He has evolved to what he is. Through making dangerous experiments, heroin certainly helps me to obtain a new spiritual outlook on the world. I have no right to assume that the ruin of bodily health is injurious, and whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever loseth his life for my sake shall find it. 23. So and so has taken it for years and is all right. 24. So and so has taken it for years and is still taking it, and he is the most remarkable man of a century. 25. I am feeling so very, very rotten, and a very, very little would make me feel so very, very good. 26. We can't stop while we have it. The temptation is too strong. The best way is to finish it. We probably won't be able to get any more. So we take it in order to stop taking it. 27. Claude Parier's story of Rudolf Hafner. Suppose I take all the pains to stop drugs and then get cancer or something right away. What a fool I shall feel. Well, what if the cancer is because of the drugs? It doesn't make things better to, uh, you know, it doesn't make things better to keep doing the drugs or something. Or, what, you're going to end your days using drugs because you're going to die anyways? Well, everybody's going to die anyways, but, you know. Help you at all, asked Lamus. Well, honestly, it did not. I had thought out most of the things for myself at one time or another, and I seem to have gotten past them. It's a curious thing that once you've written down a reason, you diminish its value. You can't go on using the same reason indefinitely. That fact tends to prove that the alleged reason is artificial and false, that it has simply been invented on the spur of the moment by oneself to excuse one's indulgences. Basil saw my perplexity. 
The fact is, he said, that you're taking this stuff as the majority of people go to church. It's a meaningless habit. I hated to put that down on my paper. It was confessing that I was an automatron. An automaton. But something in his eye compelled me. I wrote the word and broke out as I did so into a spasm of internal fury. I recollected a story from my hospital days of a man who had committed suicide when it was proved to him that he couldn't move his upper jaw. Meanwhile, Lemus was looking at my average. I had got down to less than two doses daily, but the rest of the twenty-four hours was spent in waiting for the time when I could indulge. I knew that Lou was ahead of me. She had gone on what Basil called his third class. She was taking one dose a day, but every day she was taking it later and later. She had almost an hour of real craving to get through, and Sister Athena, our sister Cyprus, our sister someone would always intervene as if by accident and take some active steps to keep her mind off the subject during those critical minutes. As soon as one had reached an interval of 48 hours between doses, one entered class four and stopped altogether unless some particular occasion arose for taking a dose. I was very annoyed that Lou should have got on faster than myself. Basil told me he thought I needed more active exercise, though already I had begun to take some interest in the sports of the place. I had even got through a whole game of Thelema without having to sit down and gasp. But there was still an obscure hankering after the drug life. It had been burnt into me, that normal interests were not worthwhile. King Lamus had taken me out climbing several times, but while I was experienced profound physical satisfaction, but, yeah, but while I experienced profound physical satisfaction, I could not overcome the moral attitude which is, really, after all, expressed in Ecclesiastes. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. My relations with Lou herself were poisoned by the same feeling. The improvement in our physical health and the intoxicating effect of the climate and the surroundings urged us to take part in the pageant of nature. Yet, against all such ideas, we could not help but hear the insistent voice of Haiti the Moreau, that the end of all these things is death. She had deliberately renounced existence as futile, and there was no answer to, our, to her pleadings. Besides this, my mind had eaten up its pepulum. I had literally nothing to think of except heroin, and I discovered that heroin appealed to me behind all veils as being an escape from life. A man who has once experimented the drug life finds it difficult to put up with the inanity of normal existence. He has become wise with the wisdom of despair. The big lion and sister Athena exhausted their ingenuity in finding things with which I may occupy my weary, aimless hours, but nothing seemed to get me out of the fixed idea that life was heroin with intervals that uh, did not count. For about a week, King Lamus tried to get me out of my groove by giving me cocaine and asking me to employ my time by writing an account of my adventures. From the time when I began to take it, the drug stimulated me immensely, and I was quite, I was quite enthusiastic for the time. I wrote the story of my adventures from the night of my meeting Lou to our return to England, from the Pauls. But when the episode was over, I found the old despair of life as strong as ever. The will to live was really dead in me. But two evenings later, King Lamus 
king to smoke a pipe with me on the terrace at sunset. In his hand was the Paradiso record, which I had written. Sister Athena had typed it. My dear man, he said, what I can't see is why you should be so blind about yourself. And certainly take an account of yourself before, you know, it ultimately gets taken account of as an important thing. <laughs>